Hello and welcome to a new episode of the Oplane podcast. Believe it or not, in today's episode there is hardly any mention to the current coronavirus pandemic. And this is because we have deliberately chosen to focus on an entirely different topic. One that nevertheless has very important long-term implications for the future of aviation. This is the relationship between airplanes and the environment. Is there a way to make cleaner airplanes? Are we soon going to be flying on electric aircraft? Is it possible for the airline industry to become carbon-free anytime soon? We're going to be reviewing all these questions with one of the top independent experts in the field of aircraft propulsion. Bjorn Ferm is an aeronautical engineer and a former Swedish Air Force fighter pilot that has been studying this problem in depth and he has been crunching the numbers. He's currently based in the south of France, from where he regularly writes a blog called Bjorn's Corner, that is part of lihamnews.com, where he combines deep technical expertise with a very accessible style. This makes it easier for people like me, that don't come from an engineering background, to understand a bit better how aviation technology works. Today I have the pleasure to have him here on the podcast to talk about the different ways that the airline industry could become a lot greener. So without further ado, let me welcome Bjorn to the podcast. Hello, Bjorn. How are you? I'm fine. Hi there, Michael. It's great to speak with you again. I remember we met, I think it was at the presentation of the A330neo in Toulouse at Airbus. That was some time ago. And we had some uh, interesting conversation about aircraft. Because you are an expert in propulsion systems, and I thought it was very interesting to speak with you today about the future of propulsion, the different technologies that are being tested to get to a greener aircraft, right? But let, let's start with um, just a short introduction. Can you tell us who you are and, and what's your work in the field of aircraft propulsion? Yes, sure. Yeah. I'm uh, I'm Swedish from the beginning, but I'm living I've been living in Europe for the last 25 years. I've been working on aircraft projects. I'm an aeronautical engineer uh, from university, but I also was accepted in the Air Force, Swedish Air Force, as a fighter pilot. So I flew the Draken uh, way back. I'm, I'm have some years under my belt, but uh, I've been working the last time, uh, last 10 years or more with uh, airliners, uh, airliner technology, so both from an airframe perspective and a propulsion perspective. And uh, uh, I cover there also, you know, uh, gas turbine engines, electrical engines, and, and stuff like that, and, and systems. So, and then uh, I also, I'm, I'm an analyst right now at Liham uh, company and also a consultant. Yeah, that's actually something I wanted to say. It's like you have a very um, interesting series of publications on the website. Uh, the website is uh, lihamnews.com. So that's L-E-E-H-A-M news.com. And, and there you have a blog where you have a very thorough examination of different technologies, not just about propulsion and, and what we're going to discuss now, but about all sorts of different aeronautical stuff. And by the way, I didn't know you were flying the Draken fighter jets. Uh, that's you know, uh, <laughs> very, uh, I, I, uh, if you're not familiar with the Draken, I suggest, uh, that's for the audience, I just suggest you go and check it online. Because it's a it's a really impressive, uh, very elegant aircraft. Yes, it is. It's uh, it's it's one of the. It's, it, it was designed in the 1950s, early 1950s even, uh, and it was operational all uh, almost until the year 2000 mm -hmm. in the Swedish Air Force. I flew it in the 1970s, late 1970s. So it was quite some time ago, but it was fun. A very challenging aircraft, very capable. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so in the in the blog that we have at Liam Company at liamnews.com, uh, we have uh, during the week we have uh, typical articles, which is you know what's happening in the uh, airliner world. We we focus on airliners, and then on the Friday I have something that I call my Bjorn's Corner, where I go a little bit more technical uh, and go through different themes you know, like avionics, like aerodynamics, like propulsion. And I recently had uh, several uh, series of articles around uh, new technologies around propulsion, including electrical hybrid uh, and other type of propulsion systems. Yeah, that's actually a very interesting area and um, one where your, uh, your fellow uh, Swedish citizen uh, uh, Greta 
uh, is <laughs> leading, leading the leading the uh, crusade. Yeah, yeah, the crusade. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. And uh, I, I think Greta does uh, uh, does a very good thing uh, putting the focus on on one of our big problems in the world right mm -hmm. now. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, uh, her uh, she she then uh, kind of observes the. The little percentage of uh, the uh, airliner world—it's only two percent of the problem. But you know, because it's so visible, it, it gets focused. But but we can discuss around what we can do there in the two percent corner of the problem of uh, pollution, especially CO2, uh, carbon. Uh, the problem of burning up all our fossil carbon uh, energy and uh, what it does to our nature. Because you have been thinking a lot about uh, all the different uh, alternative solutions that there are now with current technology. I mean, we don't know, maybe yeah. someone will come up now with uh, some uh, completely disruptive new technology and uh, things change. But with the technologies we have now available, yeah. and you have been looking at the different options and actually one thing that stands out is that you don't buy this hype about the electric aircraft and one of the points you make in your series is that uh, there's a lot of attention focus on electric but actually this might not be the best available solution to reduce the carbon footprint of the aircraft industry no i think i think uh, the reason is uh, is that it works for cars and uh, and it, it it really does work for cars i mean you have the toyota hybrid since long time which has been followed by other makes and now you have the of course you have the tesla electric uh, cars you also have here in france you have i think it's the renault uh, zeo uh, zoe zoe uh, which works so it works for cars, uh, but unfortunately, the challenges when you come to aircraft is very different. So, uh, and the reason is that cars are insensitive to weight uh, because the major resistance to moving a car is the uh, roller resistance of the tires and they don't react too much to weight. Uh, and the second thing is uh, that uh, the, the car uh, doesn't really go that fast and that long uh, and you can stop any time and just uh, put in the the plug into the wall and reload the batteries or you can actually exchange batteries also i think the zoe system has an exchange principle uh, unfortunately th this doesn't work for aircraft and, and and the problem is not the electric system in itself it is really the batteries which is the problem and, uh, and i can go deeper into that uh, uh, and compare it to other technologies uh, mm -hmm. yeah i remember um we spoke some time ago when i was doing some research for a cnn article about electric aircraft and you mentioned it's uh, one of the problems is the the energy density of the batteries that basically it's much lower than uh, yeah it's it's not it's more than much it's it's uh, almost two magnitudes lower so we have to understand that uh, the energy which is stored in the fossil fuel, the oil that we pump up and then crack to uh, kerosene or jet fuel, it is a fantastic energy store. It has, uh, if we talk about the same uh, energy measure that Tesla uses, so Tesla uh, typically talk about their car having, you know, one and a half kilowatt hour. So you can develop one kilowatt of electrical power during one hour. Uh, the one kilo of fuel, one kilo of fuel has 12 kilowatt hours of energy. One kilo of batteries has ideally a battery cell in a research lab has 0.3 mm -hmm. kilowatt hour. But when it comes to aircraft, you have to look at the system. So you have to look at the fuel system with the fuel in it and compare it to a battery system. And when we are at the battery system, the best we can do today is 0.15. So we are actually 70 times heavier. Seven, to get 70 times. Seven zero. Heavier. Seven zero times mm -hmm. heavier if we run the aircraft on battery energy instead of uh, just the kerosene, normal jet kerosene that you tank uh, on an airport. 
So basically, in plain words, uh, one kilo of uh, jet fuel, it's packing 70 times more energy than the same weight in terms of uh, battery system. Correct, correct. And, uh, and the, the thing with the battery system is that if you try to run it harder, if you try to run batteries harder, you're going into a dangerous zone. I think I put in the series, uh, because a lot of people are then coming back, yes, but they are, there are articles about batteries which are at 0.4, and they are planning to be at 0.5, uh, half a kilowatt hour uh, per kilogram in, in uh, X number of years. Yes, that's, but that's a lab cell, and the industry which actually knows most about high-performance batteries and how dangerous they are and how close you can go to them is the Formula E car racing industry because they run on batteries. And uh, if you go to them, they say, you, if you want to have more energy packed in a battery system, you are starting to be dangerous. You're starting to become closer to a thermal runaway. And anyone who has seen a video of a lithium ion battery going into a runaway situation from a portable or a, a, you know, a mobile phone or a portable computer, they realize how dangerous this is. So you can't do that. And the only way to stay away from having a dangerous battery system is to reduce the demands of capacity on the system. Basically, you are you don't put that much performance demand on the system. Correct. You right now the best battery system, the new one from McLaren Technology, uh, for the Formula E car. And mm. you know the demands of the Formula E car is it must be safe, it must be light, and it must stay together as a battery system for one year. After one year, you can change the battery. This is not acceptable for aircraft, but you know, we, we have to give it some years, so that might be improved. For a battery, you know, the battery is a very expensive component, so it has to stay at least five years in an aircraft. Otherwise, the maintenance cost of changing battery cells all the time will be too high. But let's say that we take the example of the Formula E, where it has to, to last one season and not uh, get the car to start burning, you know, you could have a thermal runaway. We are then today, for this season 2020, we're at 0.15 kilowatt hours per kilogram of battery system. If I understood these car racing batteries in the Formula E, they have somehow managed to solve this issue? Yes, they have been racing now, I think, for five years. Uh, I'm reasonably interested in racing and I formula both Formula One racing where they also have batteries but uh, I think Formula E is the battery example because they only have batteries other, the other guys also has uh, uh -huh. fossil fuel uh, as an energy store and the Formula E has not had a thermal runaway in their batteries they have numerous occasions where the system is shutting down it's mm -hmm. getting too hot uh, somehow the system, you know, they are perhaps uh, running the system a little bit too hard or something like that. So they shut the system down. And that's another danger we have with battery-based systems that if you, they, you have to have a serving each cell uh, in terms of temperature, in terms of discharge, in terms of charge and everything. So the uh, surveying system, the management system for a battery system is rather complex and that's why you know, it also takes some kilos to do that. But when you do that, you have to actually partition the battery system into many different systems because you can always run the risk of a battery system shutting down. And that actually happened in Norway on a Pipistrel electrical aircraft, demo aircraft, when the minister was flying with a guy. Uh, suddenly, on the, right over a lake, the system shut down and they didn't have any propulsion anymore. Luckily, they could swim to the shore and they did die from this happening. So, but I, I just want to say that battery systems, electrical battery systems, high performance battery systems are not safe systems unless you are very careful with what you do. And we had recently had, had two battery fires in the prototypes which are built for electric aircraft right now. Yeah, one was the this uh, aviation, right? Yeah, and uh, the other Ali. one, yeah, Alice Aviation. And the other one was the German uh, Beetle. Uh, I can't remember. The, 
Yeah, Lilium. Yeah. And in both cases, I think they went too close to the limit where they have a thermal runaway. It could be while you load, the, uh, while you charge the battery, but it could also be uh, when you use the battery. But you have to you have to know what you're doing and that's why the Formula E is such a good example because during five years of racing they have never had a thermal battery runaway. And you mentioned this uh, Norwegian case. Actually I wanted to ask you about this because I mean you're from Sweden mm -hmm. and uh, Scandinavia is one of the regions that is kind of leading the way with this electric aircraft and Norway has actually very ambitious goals in this regard. They have promised to have um, domestic flying in, a, in about a decade with a fully electric regional aircraft. How do you see uh, these goals? Do you think after all what you told us now, that are these uh, realistic goals or are there any breakthroughs expected that might make this possible in the medium term? No, I, I don't think they, you know, a full electric aircraft, meaning a battery-based aircraft, it's not possible. It's just uh, unrealistic. What you can do is you can do a hybrid aircraft where you combine fossil fuel and battery uh, as the energy store, and you're actually going to end up with 80-90% fossil fuel and the rest battery, because the battery is so heavy, uh, and it is a big problem of the aircraft. The other thing is they say it should also be more economical than a normal regional aircraft. Well, it will, will not be. I have done those calculations. There is no chance that it will be more economical. Uh, but then when you want to make progress, you can't just say it should be better in all aspects. You could build a hybrid that would work and would actually, you know, they could kind of uh, follow through on their promise, but it will be more expensive to produce, it will be more expensive to run when you look at all the costs, and it will not be more efficient than the best regional aircraft that you'll have at that time. But perhaps you shouldn't ask for that. You have to, you have to go, uh, you have to creep before you can go, you have to go before you can run. All my calculations, all my knowledge, and I actually have you know, work with gas turbine engines and other propulsion system for decades. Uh, everything, when you really sit, sit down and calculate and really start to look at it, you realize that uh, the problem is more difficult than you think and all aircraft OEMs, uh, even the most positive ones, the real aircraft OEMs, not the entrepreneurs who actually, uh, you know, are, are sometimes just uh, not realistic. They all now back out and say it will take decades before we have working hybrids and it will take even longer before we have something which is more electrical than a hybrid. But because in the hybrid you basically you are duplicating systems, right? So you're adding weight as well? Yes, mm -hmm. weight and complexity. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and I have in my corner series around uh, the uh, problems there of uh, hyping these electrical or hybrid electrical alternatives too much, uh, which I call uh, E should be for environmental aircraft and not for electrical aircraft. Where there I can say that, you know, uh, even if we want to have a battery that just helps a little bit during takeoff and climb, because this is when you need most energy during a flight, it will, for a realistic small aircraft, weigh six tons and it makes the whole aircraft virtually impossible in terms of economy and uh, usefulness. So not even in the regional, uh, because there, there was some uh, expectation, at least in the regional space, there might be some, some hope of uh, electric aircraft in, in the foreseeable future. I mean, talking about maybe a few years. Uh, there was recently this test in Canada of this seaplane. Do you think, I mean, even for general aviation or, or from some lighter? For general aviation, it has some possibilities. You know, Pipistrel, uh, which is in Croatia, uh, it, it's, uh, they are, uh, or is it Slovenia? It doesn't matter. Slovenia, I uh, think. Yeah. They, yeah, they are really good. I, I, they have made small, small sports planes. Uh, trainers which are electrical and it's a battery based aircraft but you you, you fundamentally you have one hour uh, action uh, duration on, on the aircraft and you, you stay close to your airfield 
it's it's a good solution because you know it's it's very simple uh, to load the aircraft with electrical energy and then you fly and in that case you can get the economy to work so it, it has its place it also has a place in the uh, air taxis which will stay within as the responsible uh, guy on the airbus side says the air taxis will have an operational range of 30 miles Mm -hmm. because that's typically from the airport into the center city and their battery based system can work but anything more than that if you go into the regional the typical regional aircraft uh, turboprop or jet have a typical average range of three to five hundred nautical miles and uh, they actually fly up to fifteen hundred nautical miles well anything beyond hundred nautical miles will be a problem for a hybrid and it will be a huge problem. Well, basically, you only have a proof of principle aircraft if you do it battery-based. So basically, one of the uh, approaches that you advocate in, in, your, in your writings is that there is a number of other alternative technologies that might do the trick. So the, the goal of making aviation more environmentally friendly and more carbon-free, it's actually feasible might not be necessarily through electric in your in your uh, writings you discuss a number of options maybe we can go over them some of them are basically based on on making existing systems more efficient even if that involves changing the way that aircraft are designed coming up with completely new uh, models that can accommodate them others are um, basically looking at other type of uh, fuels like uh, hydrogen for example that's another technology that actually caught my eye recently because there's a number of projects uh, that are exploring this possibility. For example, there's this company called Zero Aviation, I think it's called, that uh, they yes. design a, an hydrogen-powered system. Also here, there are different, different possibilities, right? So there's something called the inducted single fan propulsion, right? Yeah. That uh, you discuss in your writings, that it's a new way of thinking engines yeah, so uh, the principle is is simple, and it's it's not really new technology. It's been worked on and talked about for decades. So uh, the, the when you when you want to do a propulsion for an aircraft, what you uh, actually need is an air pump. So you want to throw air, which is reasonably heavy. It's about one kilo per cubic meter. You want to throw the air backwards, and that pushes your aircraft forwards, okay. And the thing is, the smaller amount of air you push it and the faster you push it backwards, the old jet engine, the less efficient this process is, the more energy you need to get the same force to drive the aircraft forward. And what we have done since the 1950s, when we only can do turbo jets, meaning have a very small uh, stream of air, which we kick backwards very fast to get the force to, to drive the aircraft forward. We have actually increased the amount of air, you know, the, the sucking in of the air in the engine and kicking out the back to a larger mass, to a larger mass of air, more cubic meters, and we kick it not as fast backwards as possible. So the turbofan, you know, the new latest turbofans, the geared turbofans, they all have the same principle. Make the bigger engine diameter, suck in more air and kick it out the back slower. You have to kick it always faster than you want to fly, but the slower you can kick it and still get the force you need, the better. The, the principle of the unducted fan uh, is the open rotor fan, you can call it, and so forth, is the same as the turboprop. A turboprop is nothing else than a gas turbine engine which is grabbing a lot of air and kicking it back even slower than a turbofan. And the open rotor or the single uh, rotor that you talked about, which is a variant of that, which has some mechanical advantages, uh, it's a middle in between a turboprop and a turbofan. And the advantage is, is keeps the speed of a turbofan uh, with the economy of a turboprop. So it's, it's kind of a middle in between. And it could be a way to go for regional aircraft, uh, go away from normal turbofans and to, to go to engines with a so-called higher bypass ratio, meaning grabbing more air and kicking it uh, out the back in a slower pace. 
it is it would, more efficient. It would be as, as fast as a, as a current jet. Yes, uh, you would get the same travel times. That's the key thing. You, 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 the, the problem that there are two problems with the turboprops today. It is the, it takes longer. You know, if you want to fly long, so if you want to fly from if you fly inside uh, Germany or inside UK and so forth, it's fine. But if you want to fly from Berlin to Rome, for instance, in a turboprop. First of all, it's going to take a lot of many hours, and secondly, turboprops are very noisy because the big propeller is uh, pushing the pressure wave from from the propeller very close to the fuselage. So, you need to get aircraft which are quieter. And you know, the, today's turbofan based jets they are very quiet, extremely comfortable, and they are quick enough so that the trip between Berlin and Rome, what could it be? Is it two hours, one and a half, something yeah. like that? Okay, okay. So so we would like to have the efficiency of a turboprop and the speed and the quietness of a turbofan. And there is a interesting development by General Electric uh, who is doing that with an acceptable complexity. There is also others like the French Safran who's done a similar engine, but a little bit more complex. Mm -hmm. And why, if this technology has been known for quite some time, why it hasn't been more widely adopted in mainstream aircraft? Because the big diameter of this, uh, it looks like a, a cross between a turbofan fan and a, and a, and a turboprop propeller. Mm -hmm. This uh, prop fan uh, has a large diameter and you actually have to design the aircraft around it. You can't take an existing design Mm -hmm. Today we have all, virtually all aircraft has the engines uh, on the wings because it gives you uh, weight uh, advantages. It's structurally very efficient to put them there if you want to have these large diameter fans. Mm -hmm. You have to find the put them in the back uh, for safety reasons, but also for uh, sound reasons. They're going to otherwise be a little bit too loud in the cabin. Because it, it well, basically, just to explain it in again in kind of plain words, I might be not completely accurate. It looks a bit like as if you were taking out the casing. So uh, normally you have this tubular cell. Case. Yeah. 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 yeah right. Cell. Yep. And if you took them away and you were left with the kind of blades of the yep. of the engine uh, just out in the open, so yeah, yep. I guess and, it, it, and you, you, the reason why you don't keep the nacelle, the outer shroud of, of the fan, is because the diameter. You want to have a very large diameter because you want to suck in a lot of air and push it back slowly. Uh, once you come to those large diameters, the nacelle is going to be too heavy. So you have to get rid of the nacelle and let the fan uh, suck the air without having a shroud around it. So mm -hmm. that's the reason. But that, that is one technology. We can also work with the turbofans we have. We can go to even higher bypass ratios and make nacelles which are light using carbon fiber composites and so forth, even more than we do today. So that's also something where we can improve. Uh, and then uh, there is also the possibility to get away from the fossil fuel, because if we, we have a fuel which is made from the carbon in the air, like synthetic fuel, uh, then we are actually taking away carbon from the air and putting it into the uh, uh, tanks, the energy store of the aircraft, and that means we are carbon neutral. So there are many ways to skin this cat, and one of them is actually to go to bio-based fuel where the sun is producing uh, the uh, carbon for us, and mm -hmm. that is also a neutral way to do it. Or we can do a synthetic fuel, uh, and then we are also carbon neutral. So the key thing is not what technologies do we combine and use to get to a carbon neutral society for, for the airliner traffic or air transport, as we call it. It is how do we get there and what techniques do we use? And there is many techniques which are more realistic and more efficient to use than just saying, you know, we'll solve everything with electric because Tesla cars can do it, then of course we can do it in the air. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the faulty thinking that people have that, you know, because it works for cars, it must work for aircraft. Let me tell you why it works for cars. It works for cars only because we have stoplights. Uh, the problem today is that wh why does electric uh, or full electric or hybrid uh, propulsion work for cars? Because the normal car engine, it doesn't matter whether it's a petrol engine or a diesel engine, is so 
outrageously inefficient. The turbofan we have on aircraft is 50 to 60 percent efficient today and 70 percent efficient tomorrow, meaning it transfers the stored energy in the fossil fuel to propulsive uh, motion uh, with a 60 percent efficiency. The cars we have today, when we drive them in everyday traffic to work, is 7 percent efficient or Good. even less, 5 percent efficient. Seven, wow. Yeah, so it's 10 times worse and therefore if you have a hybrid or electrical car you because we are always you we are accelerating that's when we use the energy we are you know driving that's when we use the energy and then the stoplight comes and we brake and our brakes are not regenerating the energy into the fuel tank it, the brakes are just heating up the brake discs and it goes up into the air dissipates into the air so we are actually destroying all the motion energy we have created and we've used fuel and, and stored energy to get this motion energy and then we just destroy it and then we start the whole cycle over again in the next stoplight so the reason why it works for car is because cars are just terribly inefficient and therefore anything that you do which is better than the normal petrol engine and the normal car engine that we have today and the whole you know the engine and the brake system really that's a combination uh, Anything you do which is better than that is seen as a success. But for an aircraft, this is not good enough. You need to beat 50 to 60% efficiency in the propulsion system to have something which is viable for an aircraft. And that's when the electrical uh, system, motor, generator, inverters, control electronics, and the battery as a storage or a propulsion uh, hybrid with its complexity, basically double everything, it just doesn't cut it compared to the very efficient uh, propulsion system we have today. And is it here where hydrogen can become a viable alternative? Uh, because it, it's got uh, zero emissions, right? So you could yes. potentially, if a way was found to make it work at the scale, you could eventually end up with a zero emission flying. Can you tell us a bit more about the different ways to use hydrogen in, mm -hmm. in an airplane yeah. and why that hasn't worked yet? Because apparently it has been researched already for years, but it has never produced uh, actually uh, something that can be built at scale and, and become mainstream. Hydrogen has many interesting features. First of all, when you oxidize hydrogen to take away the energy which is stored in, 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 stored in hydrogen, you get water. So you oxidize it with, uh, with uh, oxygen and that creates water, so H2O. Uh, so that's, that's why it really is not producing uh, any uh, waste which is a problem for us. There are some in the oxidation process you have to be careful that you don't uh, create some pollution polluting uh, uh, substances but but that's something that can be mastered. The, the, ne the positive thing with hydrogen it has, it has a very high storage level per kilogram called uh, energy density. It is actually almost three times higher than fossil fuel. So it's 30 kilowatt hour per kilo. The, there is a problem though. It is three times more demanding when it comes to volumes. So, we, so let's say that can I stop you here so it's one three second? times as efficient. Can I stop you here one second? Um, mm -hmm. Because all this hydrogen, in which state is it stored? Is it liquid? Is it gas? It, both. You could you could store it in gas or in liquid. The, the the problem of its requirements for volume is highest if you store it as a gas, and you have to store it then in a tank under very high pressure. Otherwise, the volume is just impossibly large for you to mm -hmm. handle. But in order to get it to be efficient. You have to store it as a liquid and that means you have to cool the hydrogen to minus 235 degrees celsius mm -hmm. so you know yeah. you know you have to have tanks which are uh, able right. to hold the hydrogen that cool so you have to isolate them so the problem with hydrogen is that it's very difficult to to uh, store in an efficient way in an aircraft on the other hand it's three times almost three times 2.8 times as if 
as efficient when it comes to energy per kilo. So even though you have a large and heavy tank system, uh, you do don't need so many kilos of uh, the uh, energy of the hydrogen as you have for fuel. So you can actually reduce it almost three times. Uh -huh. uh, one third the weight of, of uh, there is, at the end of the day uh, there will be less because you, you because of these large tanks your aircraft will actually take more fuel and so forth but so, so the just end of the, to summarize you need a very powerful freezer uh, to to freeze it to minus 237 degrees celsius 235 35 degrees yeah. 235 yeah uh, and, and you need lots of space to store it. Story. Correct. So the aircraft will be larger, uh, meaning it will have a little bit more, you know, it will have more drag, it will be weighing a bit, but you will have less weight of the uh, stored energy, meaning the fuel. So all aircraft manufacturers are working on this because hydrogen is, can either be burned in the gas turbine, and actually the world's first gas turbine uh, before the Second World War was started on hydrogen, on gas, gaseous hydrogen, because they, they didn't know if they could get it to start on kerosene. So, so you know, it, it works perfectly well. Once you, have, once you have solved the storage problem, you can substitute the kerosene you inject in the combustion chambers in the gas turbine, in the turbofan, you can just uh, substitute with hydrogen. You have to do some calibration. You have to do some work on the combustion chambers and so forth, but it will work. And, and actually is, there was, in the late 50s, there were projects to actually do hydrogen-based uh, research, uh, uh, reconnaissance aircraft because hydrogen has some advantages when you fly very high. And this, the byproduct of this is water? Or, Correct. Uh -huh. So it's no, no carbon... Uh, byproducts here. So it would no, be the, because of the burning process, you have to be very careful that you don't make so-called NOxys, uh, uh, NOx-based uh, pollutions. But that is a function of your burning temperature and others, and uh, that that is the same problem as you have in your gas turbines today. And the manufacturers of gas turbine engines are getting experts to understand how they should do the whole combustion process to avoid uh, producing this kind of uh, dangerous uh, byproducts of the combustion. And then the other way to use hydrogen would be to make it uh, work through fuel cell, right? Correct. That's the other way you can do it. You can ask take the hydrogen into a fuel cell and then uh, combine it with oxygen out get, gets water and the fuel cell uh, produce electrical energy that you can have to drive motors which drive fans so that's another way to do it sorry just uh, uh, just for the audience so like can you explain us in in four words what's a fuel cell and and how does it work so it's it's used to run an electric motor it it, it works like a battery but it it you you take in hydrogen you take in oxygen from the air and uh, then uh, you have a, a chemical oxidization of the hydrogen instead of a, a, a burning process. And this chemical process releases energy from the hydrogen uh, that you pick up as, as uh, electrons, meaning electrical power, and that you use to drive your motors in your aircraft. So in this case, we would end up with an electric aircraft in de facto? But instead of uh, the energy being stored in a battery, it would be stored as hydrogen. Correct. Okay. And the, you then have to have a high-performance fuel cell, uh, which generates the electrical energy, and then you drive your fans with motors, electrical motors. Okay. So what, if hydrogen is so promising, why it hasn't been implemented? Is it because of these limitations with the space and the and the uh, freezing and uh, and what else? I mean, is this dangerous or, or, or anything? No, it's well, well, it's reasonably dangerous, but we have learned to handle that. You know, we've been using hydrogen in different industrial settings since uh, 50 years, I think. Uh, so that that's handleable. Uh, the problem is that the hydrogen we, we, that we have today is mostly produced from uh, natural gas. And then you start out by having stored fossil carbon uh, 
elements and then you make hydrogen for, uh, from it. So it's not ideal. There is also an other processes where you actually take the hydrogen from the air. Uh, it's more energy intensive, but it's, it's doable. And <coughs> the reason why we haven't come further on the hydrogen side is because we don't have a good production process yet for hydrogen, which is, uh, you know, uh, available and producing large amounts of hydrogen. We have production processes, but they're not ideal. Secondly, uh, we don't want to transport hydrogen because of the large uh, volume requirement it has. So ideally, you should have a production process that produces the hydrogen at the airport and then you fill it in the aircraft. And this is all technologies which is doable. It just has to be developed and it has to find, we have to find an ecosystem, how we produce hydrogen, put it in the aircraft, have aircraft which are adapted to use hydrogen. And at the end of the day, we'll then have a very efficient, long range aircraft capable propulsion system, but it's a long way to go, you know, so it's a lot of work that needs to be done. But all OEMs are starting to work on this because they realize that batteries doesn't work in aircraft. Uh, hydrogen has potential and it's longer term, the most realistic alternative to fossil fuels we have short term. Biofuels, synthetic fuel is the realistic alternative and long, long term. With a lot of work behind it, hydrogen is a good alternative. And what about performance? Biofuels and synthetic fuels, the problem is the scale we need these. You know, the scale of, of burning of fossil fuels we do world over. 2% of that is the uh, air transport industry. There are 25,000 aircraft in the air every day in the normal time, not during COVID times, but when we don't have pandemics, we have 25,000 aircraft which are flying people around the world. So they, there is a scale problem of making those bio-based or synthetic-based fuels. Uh, and the, of course, there is a scale problem then of making the hydrogen that we need to replace the fossil fuels. But we, but that's something that we can work on, that we can solve, and we can gradually change the fossil fuel from those alternatives. So you know, it's 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 something that we need to start to do, and we are already flying with biofuels. We are starting to fly with synthetic fuels, and we need to start to make research aircraft and special aircraft. Uh, which are based on hydrogen-based uh, propulsion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, I was talking with someone in Sweden uh, a few days ago that was telling me that the biofuel industry is, uh, yeah, it's not able to really provide the sort of volumes that would be needed. That it's kind of a scarce uh, material. And there were some initiatives, yeah. actually, in Scandinavia, they were trying to make it with forestry uh, residues. So the things that come from the from the forest industry to make fuel out of that but obviously it's yeah. very low volume still yeah that's the problem with biofuels you you don't want to compete you know it it uses the same uh, raw material to produce okay. the biofuel as you also use to produce food in certain areas so you you don't want to compete with feeding the world, and that why uh, that is the problem with biofuels. Uh, otherwise, you know, biofuels is a perfectly viable fuel for the aircraft. Actually, the biofuel, when carefully produced, is actually a better fuel for the aircraft engines uh, than the fuel you get from the uh, earth. You pump up through uh, through the uh, the uh, raw oils uh, source. Mm -hmm. So it's nothing, not the problem of the fuel, it's the problem of the scale and the problem of the raw material. The synthetic fuel, unfortunately, requires a lot of energy to produce. So, but if you, the, there is a general problem in the world that we have energy production in places where we don't have energy consumption. For instance, yeah. wind, wind power is very efficient over the sea, but then you have to transport that generated energy to a place where you need it. One way to do synthetic fuel could be to, and, and another example, you know, the deserts have a lot of sun uh, energy that you could capture, but once again, you don't have any consumption in, in the desert. So one way you could view synthetic fuel is as an efficient energy storage process. And then the fact that it takes a lot of energy to make one kilo of uh, 
synthetic fuel is still an acceptable process because you couldn't really use that generated energy in the middle of a desert anyway in an efficient way. But one thing that I um, makes me think here is actually th these biofuels and synthetic fuels, you can use them with the current aircraft, with the current engine, so you don't really need to change much. In a context where the capital investment, not only for the airlines that use these planes, but also for the OEMs that have to engage in, in decades-long aircraft programs that cost tens of billions of, of euros, you, you can run these biofuels on existing planes, but if you were to use hydrogen, for example, would you need to design from scratch a whole new type of aircraft, or would you be able to adapt existing airframes and adapt them to use hydrogen? That's the problem. Uh, it's exactly as I say, with uh, biofuel and synthetic fuel, you don't have to change anything, actually. Yeah. Uh, it works as a direct plug-in replacement for today's fuels. Mm -hmm. That's the advantage of them. And, and in a short term, they are the way to gradually get away from, from burning uh, fossil fuel and thereby increasing the CO2 load of, on, the, on the planet. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem with hydrogen is you really need to design the aircraft from scratch, but you also need to design the whole ecosystem from scratch to use okay. hydrogen. What's your view uh, for the next, let's say, uh, 10 to 20 years in the aviation industry? What way do you think things are going to be going? I, I think, the first of all, you have to understand that 2% of the problem today is air transport. <coughs> and uh, you have then to ask yourself, if you look at the use of uh, the uh, energy in the world and those uses which, which produce a lot of CO2, there are certain processes where you actually could go in and change this process to produce less CO2. So going after the air transport industry and saying, I want to change from fossil based fossil stored energy in the air transport industry with priority before I actually do other things is just stupid because there is low hanging fruit. Actually, it should be the other way around. You should change, for instance, the making of cement and other processes in the industry. A lot of industrial process making steel and other things should be changed first because there is perfectly viable and available alternatives to do that in a way that produces less CO2. And then you should realize that if I need to have fossil-based, fossil-stored energy because of its high efficiency uh, for long-range air transport, then that's an exception that I have to accept until I have a viable alternative. And the viable alternative long term is most likely hydrogen based, but short term it is first to accept the fact that for mid and long range air transport, we have to burn fossil fuel. We can substitute bio-based fuel and synthetic fuel as much as we can, but we should actually put our money and our investment to take away the carbon producing hogs we have in the society. We have a lot of areas in the society which just uh, pushing out carbon-based uh, carbon dioxide uh, uh, pollution like mad, and to focus in, uh, you know, on the air transport industry as a priority is just the wrong way to do it. And when it comes to hydrogen and the other uh, projects, do you think they really stand a real chance, uh, considering the uh, development cycles in this industry? I mean, we would be talking maybe, what, 20 years from now, maybe to get yes. something... Yes, realistically, more. we are talking 20 years from now. Yes, of course, they stand a chance. I mean, it's, it, hydrogen is also an, an, uh, an alternative for other uh, transport uh, uh, systems, like the cars and other things. So it is a... Energy, you know, fuels are nothing else than energy stores. So we are lucky that the world has produced and put into Earth a huge amount of stored energy in our fossil fuels. Right now we are consuming this, we are, we are pumping them up onto the Earth, we are cracking them into different stored fuel sorts, and then we are using them. But we have to realize we need to stop that we need to get to a sustainable system where we have a, a an ecosystem where we don't 
use what was produced before. We have to produce and use what we need for the day in an environmentally correct way. And getting there is not a problem only for AdTrans, but it is for a lot of industries and a lot of activities in our world. And together we will find a way to do this. And that's the process that we should work on. But we can't just single out air transport as saying, you solve the problem first, and then we see about the other 98% of the problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, so well, I think that's a, a great wrap up of uh, our chat today. So uh, we'll see how these things go. Uh, already different projects in parallel exploring all these different technologies we've been talking about. I'll, I'll put some links in the transcript. And well, it's been a pleasure, Bjorn. Hope to uh, be able to speak with you again soon, uh, either here in the podcast or on some other aeronautical location. Who knows? Yeah. Uh, thank you so much and uh, stay safe. Yeah, thanks, Bill. And it, it was a pleasure for me as well. So until thank next you. time. Thank bye you. Bye. bye.